One of my fascinations, some might say obsessions, is with pottery. I love the variety of glazes and the forms, the shapes, the heft of it in your hand. My family knows that when we travel or when we attend events like the Marian Arts Festival, I am not going to be drawn to the jewelry or the painting or the sculpture, but to all of the pottery displays. In fact, I may have just brought back a mug and a small dish from our vacation up north last week. On one of my forays, I had the opportunity to visit a potter's studio and to speak at length with the artisan who had created the pottery on display. While she showed me the different pieces, she explained in quite some detail how each piece came into being. Now I had some vague understanding of how a mug or a bowl might be made, but until that conversation, I had no idea of how complex the process was. The clay is first wedged or mixed to release any trapped air bubbles. It's then formed using a potter's wheel or pinched or shaped or molded on a form. After some drying time, the pottery can be trimmed and this particular artist would give it a slip coat of color. More drying and designs can be carved in relief on the piece. It's then bisque fired at a lower temperature. And then glazes are applied in designs and the piece is fired one last time. When you add in the permutations of clay type, different glazes, how each glaze and clay combination responds to different temperatures, it's truly mind boggling. Each piece in, is its own unique creation, truly a work of art. In a manner of speaking, Jesus too is an artist, for from the moment he calls to those fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus, Jesus is shaping, forming, discipling the followers gathering before him. Each of the twelve bring their own individual characteristics, their own clay, as it were. Peter's brash willingness to step out in faith. James and John and their brotherly rivalry. Matthew, I might imagine, had an attention to detail as a tax collector. Jesus takes the raw stuff of all of the personalities and strengths and all of the frailties and begins to shape it. In the passages prior to today's gospel text, the 12 have already been party to much of Jesus's ministry. They have witnessed the discourses and teachings on everything from kingdom and treasure to prayer and judgment that Matthew compiles into the Sermon on the Mount. They have seen healings of lepers and paralytics, blind men and a dead daughter. They have seen Jesus still a storm and quiet the waters of the Galilee. And so subtly, the disciples are shaped and molded. They are given insight into the power of God and perhaps, more importantly, the nature of God, God's kingdom and the work of that kingdom. When we begin today's text, Jesus is immersed in the work of the kingdom. He's traveling through the countryside, teaching in the synagogues, healing people of their sicknesses, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Crowds are growing. And around him, Jesus looks out over them, and as the text says, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That portion of the text right there is one of my favorite images, for it points to this heart-aching, all-embracing compassion that God feels for each of us in our pain and brokenness, even as it evokes the nature towards which we are to strive. When haven't we each had an opportunity to look out over the world, our nation, our communities, even our workplaces and neighborhoods, and seen people who could be described as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd? People aching for something and not even knowing why. People hurting as the brokenness of the world crashes in around them or crushes them entirely. 
people searching for a new toehold on a firm foundation as everything they thought they knew about themselves and the world around them is challenged. When haven't we each had the opportunity to have our hearts ache with compassion for another or even felt that way ourselves? But the second half of this passage is telling, for Jesus sees the need and Jesus is moved to compassion by the need. But then he recasts despair into possibility. Jesus looks out over the crowds and sees not barrenness withering under a too harsh sun, but fields of harvest waving in the breeze, ripe and ready for the good news that he has to offer. The need is for those willing to labor in the kingdom of God. And so a subtle shift occurs in the beginning of Matthew 10. Listen to it again. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. And the name of the apostles are. Did you catch that? Something happened there, something important, but it goes by so fast you might not even notice it. In the first sentence, the twelve are called disciples, and the next they are apostles, the same twelve guys but given a different name. Now sometimes we have a tendency to use those two words interchangeably, but they do have a different meaning. Jesus looks out and he sees a need. He has compassion. And he summons his disciples, those whom he has been shaping and teaching and molding. But now he summons them and gives them a commission and sends them out with these instructions. He says, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, proclaim the good news. The disciples, the learners, the followers, in that moment become a possible apostles, literally in the Greek, those sent out, sent out to practice, to do what they have seen and learned. They are the first to receive this title, but by no means are they the last. Jesus at another time sends out 70. Paul himself calls himself the apostle to the Gentiles, the one sent to the Gentiles. Even we are apostles as we move outside the spaces of the church and live out our faith in the world. All too often, I think, we are tempted to treat our lives as a church as if it was an end in itself. We're happy to gather within the comfortable forms of our worship with our familiar church family. We attend fellowship gatherings, Sunday school classes, and enjoy the experience of worship. We're content to be disciples, students, learners, shaped and molded as we safely gather around our own personal experience of Jesus. But this is only half the equation. As important as that learning and growing is, it is not complete until it is used. We are not only called to be disciples, we are also called to become apostles, sent out into the world as agents of God, as laborers in God's field. I think that is one of the things that attracts me to pottery, that it is meant to be used. All of the shaping and glazing and firing create something beautiful. But unlike a knickknack collecting dust, the piece can be used, can take on an added dimension of service and worth. The comforting heft of a mug of coffee as the day quietly begins a teapot sharing hospitality and mutual confidences, a bowl recalling bread dough rising in grandma's kitchen, a vase adding to the beauty of a summer garden's bounty, a pitcher and a cup bringing us to the Lord's table, each gains in beauty as it is used. And so we too are to be used, used as laborers in the fields, proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near. And not just in what we might term spiritual activities, such as teaching Sunday school or serving on a committee of the church. Everything we do can be seen as an extension of our apostleship, our sentness, how we conduct our business, 
how we interact with our families and friends, how we choose to spend our money and our free time, whether or not we mask up for others. As Christ's apostles, we are to nurture families and individuals, educate young minds, heal hurting bodies. We care for God's creation. We keep businesses running fairly and smoothly and serve others' needs. We feed the hungry. We house the homeless and stand up for justice for all of our neighbors. Each of us have our own places to which we are called. Families, homes, workplaces, clubs, groups, communities, wherever there might be people hurting, searching, oppressed, in pain. Our world is just as full as Jesus' world with people who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Maybe more so, as so many are struggling now with the isolation and effects of COVID, both economic and health-related, and as our country itself wrestles with its legacy of racism and the violence that has been done for generations. Through it all, we are sent out by Jesus, apostles, as we witness to the God who loves all people and to the Christ who gave his life for the world. Look out around you. How will you labor? Where is God calling you into the need of our world? The possibilities are endless, existing in the mind of God and the hearts of God's people, and they will be as unique, as unique as you are as individuals, as unique as the path you have taken to this moment, and as unique as how the hand of God has shaped you. The harvest is plentiful. Ask for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Jesus summoned his disciples and gave them God's power, imagination, compassion, and love. God does the same for us, and may God bless us all in this ministry together. Amen.